Welcome to Real Menopause Talk. My guest today is Celine Yeager, and having listened to her podcast, Hit Play Not Pause, I was super excited to get chatting. An elite athlete, she didn't actually start semi-professionally or professionally mountain biking until she was 40, and she's now seeing endurance sports in particular maintain and grow the number of their more mature female competitors. And they're winning. We discuss so many different important topics, how women might be sensitive to carb deprivation, how confusing her perimenopause was to her, not least because she was yet another one of us who was taken unaware, and why should we exercise? A couple of weeks ago, I had a full peri meltdown. A stressful situation got completely on top of me, and all my symptoms came flooding back. Fortunately, I have real menopause therapy at my fingertips, but talking to a therapist doesn't require a full meltdown. Mental health is far more subtle, and feeling low all the time, not feeling like yourself, you know what that means, just needing to talk about things can make a world of difference. So I am offering you real menopause therapy for yourself. And for now, subscription is free. Sign up and enjoy half an hour for free as well. You get to handpick your therapist based on matching your health concerns, let's say menopause, with their expertise, also menopause, your work environment. Maybe you work in the emergency services or a law firm and they used to too, so they understand the unique pressures that you face on a daily basis and even your interests get to match up. From cave diving to coffee roasting, weightlifting to creative writing. So you can find somebody who really understands you. There's no obligation, no tie-in, just therapy that fits into your own schedule and can bring you back to the real and very fabulous you. Go to bit.ly forward slash rm therapy. That's B-I-T dot L-Y R-M therapy, capital R, capital M, capital T. And now... On to Celine. Celine, it is such a joy to meet you. I've been so excited to talk to you this evening. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Well, thank you, Hattie. First of all, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit about your background and your history so people know who you are if they don't already? Um, I am Celine Yeager, and I am currently the host of Hit Play Not Pause and the content creator for Feisty Media, specifically Feisty Menopause under that umbrella. So a women-owned and operated media company, which is very exciting. I come from a background of journalism. I wrote for, I did medical writing for quite a while, and then I got into the consumer part. So when magazines were in their heyday, I was writing for prevention and men's health and women's health and bicycling and all of that. And along the way, became sort of a semi-professional mountain bike racer and a personal trainer, coach, just sort of my life just blended into this one really great amalgamation of all the things I love. (laughs) So here I am. Your credentials are extraordinary. So as you've said, journalist, author, podcaster, and yeah, I am a huge fan of hit play not pause thank you all american ironman triathlete pro mountain bike racer just so that you don't underplay all your (laughs) achievements owner of feisty media and you've just attended but not raced at the ironman world championship a couple of weeks ago how do you fit it all in (laughs) um i am not i want to make clear i am the content manager but not the owner of feisty media (laughs) i am (laughs) I would, um, the, the thing would tank in a hot minute <laughs> if I was at the helm because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not business oriented, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been really great. I, I actually, I have raced the Ironman World Championship, but it's been, it's been many moons and it was very exciting to go back because it was all women on the island this year and it was wow. amazing. It was, it was frankly like I was in sort of tears all day long. Um, you know, it, I, I fit it all in the way I've always, cause it's sort of always been my life. It was interesting during the pandemic when a lot of people were like, wow, you can be really productive at home. <laughs> I was like, well, I've been doing this since 1998. <laughs> and yes, yes, you can. 
because, you know, frankly, like I, I'm an early riser. I get up around six, between six and seven, depending on this time of day and what the light's doing. And I just, um, you know, I start my day quite early. I, I make breakfast. I organize my day. Sometimes I work out in the morning, often not because I do my best creative work in the morning. So I like to write in the morning and do my podcasting and, and recording in the morning. Um, and then, in the rhythm of my day, you know, somewhere around lunchtime, I just kind of like need to go out and make some milk, right? I need to leave my computer and sort of recharge. And that fits perfectly with my training time. So I might take a two hour lunch ride, you know, I might go out for a couple hours and I come back and I'm rejuvenated, rejuvenated. I take care of sort of busy work as I roll back into it. And then I work until about dinner. And I do spend quite a bit of time even in the evenings, like, I do a lot of reading and it's just because I love it. I like what's going on, like what's going on in the medical world, what's going on in the menopause world. When I was, you know, I was a, a fitness editor for bicycling for 27 years and I would spend time just looking at what's going on in the training world in that way. So my life doesn't have a ton of boundaries, but it, I never feel like it needs them because it's just all part and partial to what I'm interested in and what I do. There's so much going on in the medical world and the menopause world. And oh I imagine there always has been in the bicycling world as well. And there is in the fitness and health industry. And so finding how many avenues you can go down. And with social media, there are wormholes and rabbit holes within the avenues. It's very confusing, I find. How do you choose which way to go? Um, this is where I do actually find it useful that I spent all those years being a medical writer and have that background and have spent a lot of time in sort of clinical literature, but also understanding that a lot of things don't get studied like exercise in the proper ways mm -hmm. because, you know, there's just no money there. So I, I just have a really good foundation to, to look at what people are saying, look at, is it evidence-based is if it's not sort of like hard randomized clinical trial based, is there something still there yeah, it, it worries me right now because women have such a need and we are a huge $600 billion market right now. And it's just like huge wide lanes for, for predatory behavior, you know, for taking advantage of us, for trying to sell us something, for tapping into all of our insecurities and our needs and our fears. And there's a lot of that going on right now. And I, you know, I, one of the things that makes it a little easier for me is that I have a very distinct lane, if you will. I talk to women mm -hmm. specifically who are active and or athletic. So whereas I might spend a lot of time telling women to exercise and trying to convince them that this is an important activity, I, I don't need to do that with the, my audience. You know, they're there. And I, I need to, in some ways it's harder, I need to help them take that next step of like, they're like, I'm already doing all the things that they're telling me to do, you know, and I'm still in this place. And I'm like, I know, I got you. And so that's where I'm looking at sort of the next level of stuff. Like, what is like, I just did that podcast, like mu mus muscle is so, so important. Muscle is everything. It is your metabolism. Mm -hmm. It is your lifelong 401k for longevity. And we don't talk about it enough. And like what it has huge ramifications, perimenopause and menopause on muscle. So like, that's a long way of saying, I look into what my audience needs and really hone in there in a in a careful scientific way. Sam Moore's episode with you was so fascinating about muscle. It was really good. And I had so many moments of listening to it going, yes, yes, yes. And we need more of this information out we there. We really do. Because the women I encounter are still scared to bulk up. And that's hard. Athletes get it, but most women, certainly general population, don't understand how damn hard it is to build muscle, certainly as we get older. It's an odd narrative because it's one that doesn't really exist in my bubble. And I am in a bubble, right? But I know mm -hmm. that it is still so prevalent out very, you know, just pop my bubble and it's everywhere. Um, I'm, <laughs> yeah. in, I'm, I'm encouraged to see the younger generation of women, not so much mm -hmm. about that. They get it. They don't mind taking up space, as they say. They don't buy into this very, very destructive narrative that women need to be as small as possible. They just don't, they're not, they're not buying that. And I'm so happy to see it. 
Um, that said, we grew up just having that pounded into us. And I understand that. And, you know, before menopause, I was an inc- very, very muscular woman. I did have people say, oh, she looks like a man. You know, I had big muscles. It never really bothered me um, because maybe I'm an athlete and because maybe I just didn't care. And at that time, it was not hard for me to actually get what some women would consider bulky. So I always kind of pushed back on that, too, when people would be like, women can't get bulky. I'm like, well, define bulky, because in their mind, they're not seeing old Arnold Schwarzenegger. They're seeing me, right? They're defining me as bulky. They're not defining and they don't want to look like me. And and that people would say that, you know, and some people would be like, I want your arms. Other people are like, I don't want your arms. And <sighs> Yeah, I mean, which is fine. I, you know, I don't take any of that anyway, as, as, except objectively. But I, I think that, A, once you get past menopause, good luck. Like, you're not, you actually are, it is very hard. You have to work so hard and eat so much protein and do all those things to get what you would even consider bulky in your own mind. I mean, that is very, very true. And B, like, you're Nobody wants to be fragile. You do not want to be a fragile older woman. Your blood sugar, Mm -hmm. your brain health, your cardiovascular health, the way you look. I mean, if you look, if you want to talk about aesthetics, I mean, making, getting your muscle back will help with all of that. And I think that we really, really need to try to above cardio, above all of it, have women put strength training at the very top of the thing. If they do nothing else, please lift it. Yes, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> Pretty yeah, please. please. Whereabouts are you then, Celine, in terms of menopause? And how was the whole experience or is the whole experience <laughs> for you? <laughs> um, I am post-menopause at this point. You know, for all, I, I have worked with Dr. Stacey Sims, who many people might know from Roar and Next Level. She's all about tracking, tracking, tracking. I have never been much of a tracker, tracker, tracker. So I can't tell you my menopause birthday. I think it was around 51. I'm not sure exactly when it happened. At some point, I was like, it's been a year. You know, it's for sure been a year. (laughs) I will say that um, my moods have never, ever been more stable in my life. And that is probably the most welcome. Yes. Right. That has been the (laughs) most welcome piece of this is that I'm like, wow, I feel so grounded. And I give so much less of an F about what anybody thinks. And I feel very into myself and into my own uh, power, if you will. And that's been like a really great thing. Like that's been a really nice benefit of being in this post-menopause space. Uh, You know, the perimenopausal piece was, and that's why I started the podcast, was very disorienting and confusing to me because I, all I ever knew about menopause was hot flashes and, um, Maybe you get some abdominal fat, you know, like that, like the things that I wrote about when I was in prevention, everybody talked about the menopot, a word I hate to this day. And they Mm -hmm. talked about hot flashes. And I didn't really think about like this very long runway to it where all this other stuff can happen that you don't know is associated with it. So I was having like wake up at 3 a.m. It feels like the world is crashing down anxiety, free floating anxiety that I just thought it was coming undone. I was just like, this is. I don't know what's happening to me. I don't like it, but I, I, you know, I would just try to like just self meditate, you know, meditate and and just talk myself through it. I had no idea it was hormonally related. I was getting some pretty severe night sweats, which again, because I was racing and training so hard, that would sometimes happen to me anyway. Even when I was younger, I would just like, mm-hmm. you know, you, you get a little off sometimes when you when you push too hard. So I didn't I didn't connect all those dots until quite a bit later and. The one that was just like, when my muscle really did seem to disappear overnight, I was like, what is happening? And that's when I talked to Dr. Stacey Sims and we start working on our book Next Level, which is all about this. And I had no idea that estrogen was anabolic. I had no idea all the things estrogen does and that your estrogen and progesterone are so involved in your neurotransmitters and your moods, all of that. And I get, you know, it makes sense if you, if you ever sat down and went, why do I feel so different at different times of the month when you have your period? Like all that makes sense, right? Then you take it to perimenopause mm-hmm. when your hormones are just like a spirograph of just, um, you know, people throwing <laughs> pain at a wall. You're like, okay, well, that makes sense. That's why things feel this way. But because there was always this like, I don't want to talk about that. And nobody talked about that. Women just didn't have that information. And I, 
it makes me really sad and frustrated at how many women have just sort of like sat alone and felt alone uh, before everybody just started, you know, screaming from the rooftops that we have to start making this more mainstream. As soon as you know what's going on and you understand, it takes the fear out of it. And you're you feel able better to already. put something into action. You really do. Yes. Yeah. And then when you find out that other people are experiencing the same, you can breathe more easily. It just sharing the information is so critical. And I will say before I know, because I, you know, you did, we want to be transparent about things. The one thing post I was not expecting and I didn't know, and I think women should know is that it's a continuum. So some stuff sort of happens, but it doesn't, you know, it can all happen sort of ran, seemingly randomly and out of order. So like once I was through the transition, some things fell off and some things got worse. Let's say vaginal discomfort got like, again, out of nowhere, I was like, ow, ouch. Okay. What's happening. And I didn't realize that could happen like two years later, you know, like two years after that. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I'm not on hormone therapy systemically but i do use vaginal estrogen as well as some moisturizers because i sit on a bike saddle for a lot a long time and (laughs) you know and there should be no shame about that either you know i think we need to like just be transparent about all this oh 100 percent. we've got to look after ourselves and each other as well and any pieces any little nuggets of information grab onto them and (laughs) then yeah share the love (laughs) yeah So in your bubble of athletes and competitors and wonderful, powerful women, I just love it. Honestly, I could hang out with it or in my head, I hang out with (laughs) you and all your podcast guests. Oh, thank you. Because it's such a joyous place to be. Has the landscape of female competition at the elite level, has that changed over the years? Has the demographic of the competitor changed? Has it aged? Yeah, that's really an interesting question. The The competitive landscape in women's sports in general has gotten deeper, faster, stronger, better. I mean, and that, uh, you know, is really a product of Title IX here in the U.S. I mean, you know, you have women who, like my generation was sort of the first one where it's like, oh, girls can play sports too, you know. But we, <laughs> But now it's just more of a very normal thing. So you have lots of women sort of entering. You know, when I started, I didn't start uh, – sort of semi-professionally, professionally mountain bike racing until I was 40. And at that time, the fields still in general, the professional fields in the, you know, the mountain bike racing and some of the traditionally male dominated sports were quite small. Mm-hmm. And now there are still races where they're quite small, but that is growing. And you are seeing women staying in sport because women in endurance, women can stay in sport a very long time, especially when you're talking about endurance sports. like. You have had in just the past few years, a woman who was, I think, 52, Leah Goldstein was, outright win race across America, like beat outright one. You are having like Camille Heron, who I've had on the show, like women who are ultra runners, again, outright beating everybody for, for like race distances on your feet that I can't even comprehend. And she's in her 40s, you know, and it's we... We have to just completely throw out all the preconceived notions that we've been given because we never tested that. We never, we, like, this is all uncharted territory. We, uh, women, especially, were not athletic in general, let alone once they got out of like high school, you know? So now you have all these women who are just continuing to push boundaries and be in sport and train hard. And they have all this knowledge because man, we have so much knowledge on training and nutrition and recovery now that we never had. We don't know where those ceilings are. We have no idea. Do you think we still have a lot to learn in terms of female endurance training athleticism? Though, Because a lot of studies have been done even on nutrition and muscle building on men and certainly college age men, but not necessarily 40, 50 year old women. Even younger. I'll give you an example. I mean, there's um, a group of researchers out of Stanford and they do uh, faster. I think it's F A S T R. But they look at all of this because you are correct. Like most of these studies were done in young college men for the longest, longest time. And now they, they have started finally looking at women, but especially in the areas of nutrition, it's so important. A study just came out, I think it was this week, 
on low carbohydrate availability in women and how it how women specifically may be sensitive to carbohydrate deprivation you know and it sets you up for low energy availability and that's when your body doesn't have enough after you train to do all the other things that's why younger women lose their periods when you're older maybe you don't lose your period you don't have it but you're losing bone you're losing muscle you are hurting your immune system i mean it's got really serious ramifications and women respond differently to low carbohydrate than men do differently to intermittent fasting than men do especially depending on their hormonal pro profiles we are different hormonal creatures and yes we are still very much you know in early days of really understanding that but there's a lot of women like the Sam Moores in the world, like the Abby Smith Ryans in the world, like the women out at Stanford and Faster. I went to the female athlete conference in Boston this year where it's just like all this research on women. And I'm like, it's about time. I would love to see that study because there's certainly over here, there is a huge trend towards intermittent fasting and low carb. I mean, low carb's been around for donkey's years. It's about time that goes the way of low fat, honestly. Yeah, I'm a big fan of eating all the foods. Yeah. It's, it's hard to convince Gen X that actually carbohydrates are good. So that sounds like a great study. How do you specifically take care of yourself physically and mentally and with still training so much? Obviously, recovery is a key part to that. Yeah, I, I am very, uh, you know, fueling is a big part. I was not immune to all of the low carb, you know, you're an endurance athlete. You have to try to like eat as little as possible so you can be as lean as possible, you know, and that that always backfired on me. My blood sugar would go up. My cortisol would go up like. It, it never really worked very well for me. My training wouldn't be as good. So at some point, you know, menopause just sort of made you or made me sit there and go like, okay, <laughs> now like let's let's take stock and let's really let's practice what we preach. And I started just eating. I just like I'm hungry in the I'm just going to eat. I'm going to eat two pieces of toast. I'm going to go wild. I'm going to have two pieces of bread in the morning. And my God, I felt so much better. I wasn't hungry at ten o'clock. I had energy for my training, you know, I was like, oh, hey, I'm on to something. I even wore a CGM to watch. And like when I deprived myself, my blood sugar was way less stable than when I actually fueled myself. You know, I mean, it, it's it's amazing how the body really operates well when it is, you know, taken care of properly. So fueling myself has been a huge thing, particularly with those carbohydrates and not being afraid to eat. And I take very good care to sleep more. When I was younger, I didn't necessarily, I, I could get away with a couple five hour nights and I was really okay. But now I'm just like, I'm, I make sure I get to bed. I have a stack of books, you know, on the side of my bed, depending what I want to read at night. But I just really respect that, like, wind down, read a book, respect your sleep. And I solid seven hours, you know, I don't wake up on the alarm. I wake up, I wake refreshed. I think that's, I think that's huge. I think it's an enormous, enormous thing. And if more people uh, really respected their sleep and took care of it, we'd have a lot less upset <laughs> off kilter people in the world. But that's a whole, that's a whole other thing. Um, but also, I just really, it's all the, you know, it's not sexy, but it's all the little things, you know, I actually do warm up before I run now, you know, it's something that I might not have done before, right? I walk and, and do some dynamic moves for three, and it's just three minutes, but I just do that. I make sure that I strength train year round. Whereas before, well, I'm not going to lie because I just to talk about like letting about two months of the summer go because I love summer too much to be inside. But I do like, I, 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 I'm very diligent about all of those things. And I think the consistency in that kind of super simple behaviors really pays off. I think that's part of the trouble you sort of alluded to there. It's not sexy. It's not rock and roll, but it gives us longevity, which I certainly underrated when I was tw in my twenties and thirties. And now it is gold. <laughs> um, and sleep. I am really, really comfortable with that. It makes me happy. Recently, I listened to a radio program about older and I'm not quite sure they didn't specify what older meant but older people what does that yeah mean? exactly was it 70 or 80 or was it you know not not clear um 
getting into exercise. And one of the barriers, which I found very interesting, was family and friends suggesting that they shouldn't. So I'm guessing it is much older, but saying, oh, are you sure? This is my favorite phrase. You want to do that? I don't like being told what I want to do. I know what I want to do. But do you want to do that? Are you sure? Is it safe? Are you sure that's a good idea? All that kind of thing. And like, again, you've already said earlier for strength training, don't get like a man, but there's no kind of two way here. It's just people telling you, don't get so muscly. You look like a man. Don't get too big. Don't get too small. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So how do you push past this and just get someone going? Because there's got to be somebody listening saying, well, I know I need to start, but yeah, how how do I push past the resistance? Not exercising is the most dangerous thing you can do. Full stop. Full stop. I mean, that's, that is really the answer. <laughs> Our bodies are built to move. And I can give you a mountain of inactivity research that shows how terrible being sedentary is for you on every single level. Like, exercising protects your brain. Resistance training, everybody listen, may be better for your brain than cardio. They have found this wonderful hormone called irisin that is muscle generated and resistance training, high intensity exercise stimulates. It is related to less risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Like it's really important. Your muscle, really important. Metabolic health, diabetes, weight gain, heart disease. I could, again, dementia, I could go on and on. Joint health. Yes. Go to the Arthritis Foundation and you will see in their own literature that resistance training and movement is the best medicine for your, for your, for your joints. Like it helps. It helps all of those things. It's anti-inflammatory. I could go on and on and on. So you are at, so look around the general population. A lot of people getting joints replaced, getting being aches and pains and having all of these issues, the vast majority of people are sedentary. I mean, we know that's not good for you. And I, I'm very sympathetic to people who really hate exercise because if I really hated moving, I don't like to do things I don't like to do either, right? Like if you, if you told me that crocheting would add 10 years of my life, I still probably would never <laughs> do it. I, I, I'm very sympathetic to it, but. But if somebody wants to, you cannot tell them that they shouldn't because of a risk because it's not true. It's non-existent. Like having somebody sit in a chair or be sedentary is literally taking years off their life be, instead of having them get up and move and live. I, I feel obviously feel very passionately about that. And there is no appropriate age for whatever. I mean, I, that's one of the things that's been so cool about doing this community and this podcast. Like, there are women in my community who are, you know, they're rock climbing, they're doing CrossFit, they're doing Spartan races, they're doing all the things. I mean, the field, the the size of the field of 70 plus athletes at Ironman World Championship was mind blowing. So it's, you you got to keep moving. You're, you're made to move. Well, I believe that women are built to endure. And so endurance training that's true then, too. you know, there's got to be something in that. And I also believe that we are physically strong as much as we want to be. So that was another thing. Yes, obviously you start small and you build up. There's no way that you're going to walk into a gym and pull 200 kilos off the ground. Nope. Yes, that is a fact. But how do you feel about long-term mini pink dumbbells? <laughs> Okay. I have very, obviously very strong feelings about that too. Because (laughs) again, I wrote for magazines that would tell women to lift five to eight pound weights and that was all they needed. Right. I, and I regret every single time. I still am (laughs) on my karma bus. I'm driving this karma bus so hard and so fast trying to make, make up for doing that because pick up, go to the grocery store and weigh your groceries, weigh them. Weigh a suitcase. When you go to the airport and you put it on there, it could be 40 pounds, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, that is the kind of stuff. Pick up your kid or your grandkid. Do any of that stuff. It's all more than eight pounds. I promise you. The bag of cat food that I just picked up is more than eight pounds. So it's, we need to lift weights that are like really indicative of what we do and what we, more importantly, what we want to do in our life. And 
lifting and training and lifting heavier weights, you know, with good form in a, in a structured environment is just going to empower you in your life. You are going to become so much more efficient at everything, at walking, at you're going to have more energy. It's good hormonally. So yeah, I mean, it's, yes, you want to start out and sort of condition your tissues and get your joints and everything ready for heavier loads to come that you're going to be lifting more consistently than say picking up one bag of groceries one time. But you can do so much more than that. I mean, even people who are in homes, they do, they do research on people who are like, literally homebound, you know, in like elder care, they can lift more than five or eight pounds. So yeah, you can do more. <laughs> <laughs> Once you are up and running then, and certainly at your level, do you find that mindset plays a role? Because then there are days even with some athletes that I've spoken to and they're about to compete and they will have a wobble They'll think, who am I to be doing this? Or what if I can't do it? Or what if I was better last year? Um, which I'm sure is a natural process. And then there are the deep self-limiting beliefs and the self-belief that is right deep at the core of probably everybody. It's just how on earth you access it. So how far can you really go? And how do you optimize your self-belief? You can go so much further than you, you think you can. I mean, that is proven time and time again. We all have much, much more in us. And I think that I have the privilege of seeing so many people. I, even when I was very, very young, when I was in my 20s and doing some races, you know, I, I did a really hard 24 hour mountain bike race one time in West Virginia. And it was frankly almost terrifying how hard it was, you know, going down these mountains in the dark. And I, I felt so badass and I was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And there was a guy with one arm that was also doing it. And I thought, okay, all right. <laughs> you know, that, that teaches me about what's possible. You know, one of my first triathlons I did, there were three women with over the age of 80. And I thought, okay, all right. That's, you know, and, and I just made all these mental checks. And I think one of the beauties of doing these activities yourself, and I am not immune to that. I, I get up before every event and I feel overwhelmed with nerves. I mean, it, it, I, I think, why am I doing this? Why did I sign up for this? I'm going to suck. And when I suck, my career is going to tank because no one will listen to me because I suck. Oh, my heart, my head just goes like, you know, I'm human, but I, but you build up a reserve of you've been there before and you know what to do. And you know that that is a very, those nerves are very transient. That self-doubt is transient. And that once you start doing the thing, it's just putting one foot in front of the other. It's taking one pedal stroke. It's just doing the, doing it, taking care of yourself. Do you need food? Do you need sugar? Do you need hydration? And then you finish. And that's one more tick of empowerment on your belt. It's one more tick of confidence. It's one more time and if something goes wrong, even better, because if you get through it and you get to the end, you're like, I know how to problem solve. And that that just like that transcends sport and it goes into your life. You know, I mean, there's there are times that I am driving somewhere and I'm like, oh, my God, we're going to be sitting here in traffic for three hours. And then I think I've sat on my bike for three days. You know, like I can I can entertain myself. I can entertain this. I can endure this. And it really does. It just it makes you. Everything you do builds on itself and just makes you better for the next thing you do. And sure, there are times that I wake up and I'm like, oh, it's raining and it's cold. And I don't really want to go on this ride because it's raining and it's cold. But it's never as bad as it is in my head. And like once I'm out there, I never regret it. And it's just like it's very cliche to say give yourself 10 minutes. But honestly, if you do, if you just say, OK, I'm just going to start. And if I'm truly miserable after a half hour, I have the carte blanche to go to the coffee shop. And you just let yourself do that. And very rarely will you ever just be like, I'm done. I'm pulling the plug. And any tip for a first time competitor? Just enjoy it. Just take it. Honestly, like whatever it is, like just realize you are not alone in whatever you're feeling. Everybody feels kind of like throwing up. Everybody has to pee 12 times. You know, lots <laughs> of people are very nervous and in their head, they're not thinking about you because they're so engrossed in themselves. <laughs> you don't even have to worry what they think about you. And, and don't be afraid to sign up for things because you think that you're just going to be surrounded by Olympians. Like go, 
go spectate a marathon sometime and watch all the sea of humanity that's coming at you. Body types of every single shape and size. I routinely get beat by like this man. You know, I mean, he does, like I hate to say doesn't look like, but it's not your stereotypical quintessential sort of running build. But the guy gets his, his own motor. And I'm just like, that's great. Like, people can be very great in all different shapes and sizes. And you don't have to be any specific s- speed. You just get out there. And the sense of accomplishment you get from from doing it and the what you learn along the way for training for it, whatever it is, is it, it really is uh, transformative. You mentioned earlier Dr. Stacey Sims, and you've worked with her on RAW. There's a new one coming out soon. Is that right? And can you give us any little sneak preview? Oh, boy. It's it's not brand new because that would be we, I don't even know what that would look like. <laughs> it is updated. That that book came out. We started working on it just about 10 years ago because we is started really? working on it. And well, we started working on it. Yeah. But in 2014, it came out in 2016. So, you know, for a book like that, a lot has happened. You mm-hmm. know, so we had to go in and update, you know, the research with all the new studies. I mean, I will say that it's not like it's a sea change different, you know, but there are different findings as far as like the the carbohydrate research that we talked about. Low energy availability has become much better understood, uh, which is really helping women to eat properly and to fuel properly to avoid all of those problems we talked about. We didn't... (laughs) There weren't any aura rings or whoop straps. I mean, all that stuff is pretty new, you know? So we talk about that kind of stuff. And heart rate variability is really hot right now, but it it's different for women because a lot of these devices don't take into account that our hormonal fluctuations actually affect these things. So the scores we're seeing may not be completely reflective of what's going on. So it's that kind of thing where we just went chapter by chapter by chapter and updated the research and gave new like completely new entries like cold plunges and sauna that's all kind of new you know all that kind of stuff like anything that's really out there in the space right now we wanted to make sure we addressed it so it was quite a bit of work took a few years off my life but it should be out (laughs) (laughs) early next year i will look out for it most definitely and finally what does good health look like for you from now on oh boy Wow. You know, it really looks like it, I guess it like health in general has always looked about the same to me, but I put so much more gratitude and prize on it. You know, like when you get to a certain point, especially, you know, I am 54, you see, you see people start to fall away. I've lost friends. I didn't like friends of mine who have had heart attacks, friends who have had strokes, you know, like stuff starts happening and you start seeing it and you're like, Oh, like this is real, you know? And and I, 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 I'm just so grateful to have a strong body that is able to do things. And, you know, one of the things that women struggle an awful lot with and that breaks my heart a lot is the body image thing. And, you know, your body is going to change. You're going to have uh, wrinkles that you didn't have and you're going to have, uh, muscle tone changes that may not make you happy. But man, if you can live through your body and live forward and really just be, be grateful and focused on being strong and capable and able and living outside for the experience of living rather like internally, it's a, it's more meaningful. And it's, uh, I don't know that that's where I'm at right now. It's just like, I, I want to live outwardly and experience as much of life through my body not for my body as possible so it's about being active and vibrant and happy and content in my own skin and that is really the most I don't know I don't think anything's more important than that thank you so much Celine it has been brilliant talking to you I've really enjoyed it thank you very very much thank you thank you for having me I will leave Celine's details in the show notes and I would like to recommend Hit Play Not Pause as a great and interesting podcast. A final note on Real Menopause Therapy, subscription is still free and sign up is obligation free as well. Have a look around, see how it works and find someone that matches you. Go to bit.ly forward slash rm therapy. That's bit.ly 
forward slash capital R, capital M, capital T for therapy. Thank you for listening. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thank you.